Father, we just thank you for this glorious day. We just thank you that we have, through social media, the opportunity to just get together and fellowship with one another. And so, Father, we just pray this afternoon that the simple message that I have will somehow touch someone's heart, that it will bring some encouragement, some upliftment to someone. And so I just thank you for it as I invite the Holy Spirit to just be with us this afternoon as we spend a little bit of time together in fellowship. Well, I trust that everyone else out there has remembered what I shared last week and the week before. I touched on Mark 4, verse 37 to 40, speaking about the Lord telling us not to be fearful. Uh, uh, disciples saw the storm rage about them, and he was just sleeping. And I said at the time that, you know, sometimes we feel that the Lord needs to do something and he's doing nothing. And actually what the Lord is saying is, why are we fearful? He is in our life's boat with us. And so while we're going through this time of lockdown and of uncertainty with regard to coronavirus and with regard to the uh, 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 social distancing and being at home without being able to work, etc. Let's just keep our focus on that. Jesus is in the boat with us. He may not be doing anything because he's saying, listen, son, listen, daughter, I got your hand. I've got you. I'm with you in this situation. Now, last week I asked people to tell me to give me their expression. And what came said to me, you wanted me to teach. So that puts me in a bit of a predicament because teach, I like teaching. But this week, I want us, before I can really start teaching, I want us to ensure that we are on the same page uh, in terms of the faith. It's very difficult to start teaching people. You don't know where they're at and what they believe and what they do not believe. So today, please just bear with me, be patient, humor me, as I'm going to endeavor to take the next half an hour and do 6,000 years of, of, of historical background. And in doing that, we're going to determine where we're at in terms of our faith. Now, 6,000 years is a long time for me to cover in this short period of time, but I'm going to have to just touch on that. Just bear with me. If you've got a pen and paper handy, just dot down the scriptures that I'll, I'll share. And, um, and let us see where we're at in terms of, of the faith before I get into some real teaching. Now, the first verse of the Bible in the first book of the Bible, begins with, in the beginning, God. The verse continues, but I'd like to stop there. And I want to, I've, I've entitled this week's message, and I've entitled it, You Are Part of God's Plan. And I want every one of you listening to me to understand that you, as you're sitting there, are part of God's perfect plan. You're part of God's eternal plan. And that's what I want to reveal to you today. But I'm going to do this in terms of this historical background. In the beginning, God. That means that in the beginning of all things that is known to, to mankind, all the things that we've discovered in terms of science, no matter what science, whether it be medical science, whether it be astronomy or physics or whatever, whatever we have discovered as human beings, before that came, there was God. Now, you can call him whatever you like to call him. You can call him Yahweh or Jehovah or Elohim. I just call him Father. My Father, his Son, and his Holy Spirit in the beginning, decided to create our universe. Not because he was lonely. We've got to understand that God is uh, 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 self-sufficient. 
God is almighty. God is all knowing. And before he began to create the universe that we are in, uh, there was an eternity past that he existed without us. He doesn't need us. He didn't need to say, I'm going to make some little people so that I can uh, um, not be lonely anymore. But he created us and the universe for his own pleasure. Now, I think most of us can understand the pleasure in creation because in creating something because God had already installed a part of, of his nature or his character in us. And, and, and that part is that ability to create. Some of us are artists. And you take out your paintbrush and you go and sit on a beach or in a lovely countryside. And you use that marvelous talent and you start creating on, on, on your canvas. Others make models and they feel they've created something or they design gardens. You know, some people knit. Or even cooking can be a creation or, or cakes for some people. And we do all of that creation because we get satisfaction. We get pleasure out of creating. Isn't it lovely? If you've ever done something, if you've ever created something, whether you're an artist or whether you're a builder and you've built something. But when we just stand back, oh, I used to love it. When I did something, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a... A jack of all trades and master of none. And I used to try my hand at everything. And I could build the tiniest thing, maybe two little steps. And I would take more time looking at my handiwork than I did actually doing the job. It gave me such great pleasure just to feel, look, I've done this. This is me. I've created this. And so God did this. He created for his pleasure. And when he God created the greatest creation that he made was man or humanity. And the reason <clears throat> that we were the greatest of his creations was because he created us in his likeness or in his image. And therefore he said uh, in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our own image. Note the us, the us is Father, it was Holy Spirit, Son, and, and Father. Let us make man according to our own image. And then he goes on in verse 27, and the word says, In the image of God he created him, mankind or humanity, male and female, he created them. And so God created Adam and Eve, and he created them with a freedom of choice. They could choose to have fellowship with him, or they can choose not to do so. And this freedom of choice sadly had to be tested. Now, this is my imagination. Please don't go and say, I said, the Bible said. This is me. I'm perceiving because I question things. When I read the Bible, I ask, why? How did that happen? Why did that happen? And I'm looking and I'm saying, God created this humanity. And he had to somehow test this freedom of choice. Now, I don't think, and that's why I'm saying this is my imagination. I think that God allowed Lucifer to test our freedom of choice. Because I think somehow the angels must have come. The angels, this is my imagination now. The angels might have come to the Lord and said, you know what, Father? <clears throat> you allowed our freedom of choice to be tested by the greatest angel that you've created. That one, the musician. That one that could play music instruments, that could sing so beautifully. That one named Lucifer. He came and he tested our freedom of choice. And in testing it, one third of us decided to follow him instead of God. And so 
they stood and they said, now you create this little Adam and Eve. You give them freedom of choice, but it's not tested. And so God, somehow, I think he said, all right, <clears throat> being the righteous father that he is, he said, okay, I'll put something there to test them. And so in the Garden of Eden, God put this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he gave Adam and Eve one law, one, just one law to obey. One law in which their freedom of choice could be tested. He said, out of all these trees in this garden, you can eat, but of this one tree, do not eat. We find that in Genesis 2 verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. And sadly, <clears throat> they could not obey this one law. And so we find in Genesis chapter 3, that Satan possessed a serpent and spoke to Eve. Now, let me just stop there because <clears throat> when I've made this statement in the past that Satan possessed the serpent, people said, no, wait a minute. You know, Satan could have just taken on the shape of a serpent. Well, I don't believe that because if that was so, then why did God punish the serpent? If you get what I'm saying. You see, the serpent allowed himself or the serpent allowed itself to be possessed by Satan in order to be the one that spoke to Adam and Eve. And because of that, God, you will be punished also. And so Eve looked at this tree with new eyes as the serpent presented it to her. And she found it to be, number one, good for food. Number two, pleasant to the eyes. And number three, desirable to make one wise. We find that in verse 6. And, and so she took and she ate. And she gave to her husband beside her. And he ate also. We find that the Apostle John later comes and he refers to these three basic temptations. And you can go and look it up. You can go and see when Jesus is tempted, the same things occur. The same three tests. These three basic temptations. Now, John comes in 1 John 2, 16, and he says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. <clears throat> That's where Satan will test you. That is where he has always tested everyone. And now the first thing that happened when Adam and Eve suddenly realized once they ate of this fruit, they looked at themselves and they realized they were naked. Up until that point, being naked didn't mean anything to them. In their innocence, it didn't give them terrible ideas or lustful thoughts or shameful thoughts. They were not ashamed of their bodies. There was no problem. Oh, and then someone said to me, oh, and that's why sex was the apple. No, 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 no. Don't get it wrong. When God first create, created them, he said, go forth and multiply. He didn't say, go forth and multiply once you've disobeyed me. Are we together still? I hope there's someone out there still. <laughs> so they then decided, right, we've now discovered we're naked. We feel that it is shameful to be naked. So we're going to cover our shame. So they quickly took fig leaves and sewed them together and made themselves some kind of clothes. We find that in verse 7 now. Now, the, the strange thing is that the minute we realize that God could see us as we really are, in other words, he could see us naked, he could see the real me, the desire is to create, to create something to try and cover up or dress up our vulnerability. We don't want God to see the real person. So we, we find something the same as they did to cover up our vulnerability. Don't, oh, God mustn't see me as I am. He mustn't see the real me. Let me cover it up. 
The next thing they did was to attempt to hide from God. In verse 8. Now, do we not also try to hide from God the minute we walk in disobedience? It's the first thing we do. The minute we realize that God said, don't do this and don't do the other, and we've done it, we've given in to the lust of the eyes or the, the pride of life, then we want to hide from God. <laughs> the obvious thing, however, is that we cannot hide from God. And so when God cornered Adam, he told God that he hid because he was afraid, because he was naked, in verse 10. And then Adam did the blame shift thing. He told God it was all God's fault, really. Because the woman God gave him, gave him of the tree to eat. Find that in verse 12. He says, the woman you gave me, she gave me to eat. It's not me, God, it's her. And again, it's so true to nature. How often do we find that we blame the church? How often do we find that we blame the pastor? How often do we blame other Christians or our circumstances? How often do you blame your wife or your husband for our own disobedience? Oh, Lord, if, 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 if she didn't do this, if he didn't say that, if only the pastor was more attentive, if the church was more loving. You see, so what happened in history still happens today. Our human nature has not changed. And all of a sudden, there's this sin problem has now entered into the world. Sin is nothing more than disobe disobeying God. We've got to understand that. That's all Adam and Eve did. They ate of the tree they should not have eaten. God said don't and they did. And no matter what it is, if God says don't, we do. Then we have sinned. And it doesn't mean one sin is greater than the other. Or oh, I'm not like Steve. I don't sin as badly as he does. No, if you've disobeyed God, you've sinned. And so all of a sudden, we have this sin problem. And having rebelled against God, man, Adam and Eve now, gave up their dominion on earth. They gave it up to the one they chose to obey instead of God, which is Satan. And because of that, Satan became the ruler or the God of this world and of this age. You can Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. You can go and see what Paul says about that. And the biggest consequence of the fall or the falling into sin was death. Death simply means separation. There's two kinds of death. There's physical death and there's spiritual death. Physical death separates us from life here on earth. Temporal life. Spiritual death separates us from God. It separates us from eternal life. And so the Bible teaches that life is in the blood. And also that the blood makes atonement for the soul. You can write down in Leviticus 17 verse 11. Go and read about that there. And so God now had the sin problem with Adam and Eve, so he had to shed innocent blood of an animal to atone for their soul, to restore the life that they had lost. And he took the skin of that animal and made them some lovely leather tunics to wear. And at that point in time, the practice of sacrifice for sin was instituted. 
And as they multiplied, the human race became more and more sinful. God had to interview, uh, to intervene before his precious creation was lost forever. But he had to do this legally. You see, we got to understand that God has made certain spiritual laws and he's placed them there for all eternity. And the lawgiver cannot become the lawbreaker. You see, God doesn't make a law. He's not, he doesn't say, do as I say, not as I do. He says, if I've said, do not do this, then I also do not do it. And so he had to come up with this eternal plan to save humanity. But it had to be done legally. And so he began to search for a man with whom he could cut covenant. And this is vitally significant. Because if God could not find a man that he could cut covenant with, God could not interfere. Because man was given dominion, man was given rule on earth. Man gave that rule away to Satan and God couldn't come and bully his way in. He had to do it legally, even though Satan did it illegally. But that's beside the point. God had an eternal plan. But he had to accomplish it legally. Now, covenant terms, and that's a strange term or an alien term for modern people. And by God's grace, if we're going to teach, maybe we'll just go and teach about covenant a little bit as well. But covenant was cut between two parties. And it could be cut between two nations and two kings. And covenant is an agreement. It's like a husband and a wife enter into covenant. And we can see the principles of covenant between God and man, king and king. And husband and wife, the principles are basically the same. Covenant says, whoever touches you is touching me. Covenant says, whatever is mine is yours. Now, in a true, in a true marriage, whatever I own belongs to my wife. She doesn't ask permission. She takes not mine anymore. It's ours. And if anyone touches her, it's like touching me. Isn't it wonderful that that's the covenant God wanted with humanity? That's the covenant he wanted with a man. Whoever touches you is touching me, he says. And God finally found such a man. He found it in Abraham of Ur. Genesis 11, verse 27 to 28, dash it down, write it down there. God's perfect plan now, I'm going to reveal it, was to send his son to live a sinless life as a human being on earth and then to become the sacrificial lamb that was slain once for all. John 3.16 tells us that. Romans 6 verse 10 tells us that. Write down these scriptures. Read them together. But before God could send Jesus, Abraham's commitment to covenant had to be tested legally once again. Because otherwise the accuser of the brethren, Satan, could have gone and said, hang on. You made covenant with him. Who says he was going to be loyal and faithful to that covenant? Who said Abraham would have kept that covenant? And so, yeah, the test had to come again. And so God told him to sacrifice his only begotten son, Isaac. Read in Genesis 22, verse 2. And also chapter 6, verse 12. Oh, oh, sorry, also verses 6 to 12. Interestingly, we've got to understand about Isaac is that he was not a child. 
Many think of this little innocent boy. Isaac was actually, people argue a little bit, but you can go do your own research. I think he was 37 years of age, as far as I could establish. He was a grown man. He wasn't this innocent little child that his daddy forced onto an altar and tied him with a rope. He actually willingly laid down his life out of love for his father. Does that ring a bell? Isn't that what Jesus did later? The time, however, was not right for God's perfect plan. And a lot of people ask me now, why? If that was God's perfect plan, if Abraham now was willing to sacrifice his son, which now gave God the legal right to sacrifice his, why didn't God do it thousands of years ago? Why did we have to go through all? Well, there's lots of reasons for that. Number one, God had to have a physical people to serve as an example for his spiritual people. A physical people who would obey, who would disobey. Who would turn from and would who repent again. And they served in his example for us, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, so that we do not make the same mistakes. But there's more to it than that. God had to reflect Jesus through tabernacle. He had to introduce Jesus to us through tabernacle. And there's a lovely teaching that I might share with you sometime. How Jesus is depicted throughout everything that happened in the tabernacle. You see? Also, God had to have these experiences happen so that you and I have got a Bible to read, to serve as a witness. But more than that, God had to have the, the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs, the prophets of old, to announce the coming of a Messiah. There had to be a proclamation. People had to know the Savior, the Messiah is coming. And so it had to be delayed so that we could believe. Are we together? And so Abraham and Isaac and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, which later became the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And they became God's people. And God looked after them and God gave them a promised land. And we're not getting into all of that. But we do discover that soon enough, Israel, God's people, became sinful and disobedient. And so instead of the one law that God gave, Adam and Eve, suddenly God gave five books full of laws. And sadly, they also were not able to keep those laws. And so now finally, I'm going to come to God's eternal plan. I hope I haven't lost any of you. I hope you're still with me. So finally, the day arrived. There was a voice in the wilderness called John the Baptist, and he was proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. And you know what? You and I are proclaiming the second coming. And finally, the day arrived when God sent that only begotten son. And we must understand that the only way into humanity is birth, the only legal way. See, God has got these laws. And I want you to, to look at John chapter 10 and verses 1 and 2. Write it down or open your Bibles there if you like. And so Jesus had to be born into humanity. He had to be born in human form because the door to humanity is birth. 
And John 10 verses 1 and 2 says the following. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, we are the sheepfold, humanity, by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Who has come to rob, steal, and destroy? Who entered and began to rule over humanity, not through the door of birth, but in another way, like a thief? You hear what he says in verse 2? He says, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And that is why Jesus had to be born of a virgin Mary with the Holy Spirit impregnating her so he could be both God and human, fully God, fully human. And the next 30 years of his life, he spent being tested and being tempted in everything that you and I have been tested and tempted in. He was totally human. And as such, he hungered, he thirsted, he could feel pain, he felt the cold, he could get tired. He had emotions like we do, and therefore he could hurt, he could love, he could anger. Remember, he upturned the, ta the, the tables at the temple because he got angry because of what they were doing in his father's house. But in spite of that, in spite of all this being purely human, he lived his life without ever committing a sin. Thirty years has now passed. And then he was baptized in water as an adult. And at that same time, you can read about it in Matthew 3 and verse 16. At the same time, as he came up out of the water, after he was baptized by John the Baptist, as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him or descended upon him like a dove, not in the form of a dove. Let's get that out. Have you ever seen how a dove comes to land and sit down gently? So alights so gently onto something. And that's how the Holy Spirit came down upon him, like a dove, not in the form of a dove, like a dove, gently. And all of a sudden, Jesus was empowered, was equipped for his ministry by that Holy Spirit. And so he then went out making disciples and teaching those disciples. Now, there was one problem or so, I thought, with God's perfect plan. And that was that Jesus was restricted by his human body. That restriction meant that when he was in Jerusalem, he could not be in Samaria. But God said, no, no, I did not plan on one Jesus. I had planned on many Jesuses. And those Jesuses that came or that would come would have to be equipped by this same Holy Spirit, empowered for the work of the ministry. And that's why Jesus said in John 16, verse 7, he says, It is to your advantage. Some Bible translation says it is expedient. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is sending you. God's eternal purpose for us is to be conformed to the image of his Son. God didn't, he said, I'm not going to have a restriction. I know this is my only begotten son. You see, we can't make atonement. We can't shed our blood. In fact, we can't even live the sinless life that he lived. 
So we can't become sacrificial lambs, but we can go out and live the message. And we can go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he said, I'm not going to limit him to Israel. I'm going to have many sons who will all go out. And that was his purpose. That was his perfect plan. And you are part of that plan. As you're listening to me right now, I want to tell you, stop running away from God's purpose for your life. Hear me. I'm speaking to you. Stop running from God's purpose for your life. Don't tell me you're not intelligent enough. You're not eloquent enough. Listen, this man does not deserve to be in ministry. This man is not worthy to be in ministry. Not intelligent enough. But I've been in ministry for over 40 years. And I've made mistakes along the way. God's not here looking for your perfection. He's not here looking for your worthiness. He's here looking for your obedience. So obey today. Look at Romans 8 and 29. He explains his purpose for your life and for my life. He explains his perfect plan of saving the entire humanity. God's plan was not for some to be saved and some to be damned to hell. In fact, hell was not created for man. It was created for Satan and his fallen angels. He came to rob and steal us of our salvation, of our eternal life. He came to rob and to drag us down there with him in spite, in revenge for God sending him there. And I'm reading Romans 8.29 now. For whom he foreknew, he being Father God now. And the word, the Greek word there is prognosko. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, the son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let me blow your religious bubble and now people can get angry with me. These people that say I'm a child of the king, you know, sorry. My brother is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm not his child. He's my big brother. The father is, is my father. I'm the child of the father. Jesus was the first of many brethren. You and I are the many brethren. God's plan was to have many sons with Jesus as the firstborn. And hear me clearly again. I'm not saying that we could pay the price for other people's sin. I'm not saying that we could have become the sacrificial lambs. Impossible. We could not live the simple, sinful, sinless life that he lived. But we are here to finish what he began. We are here to go out and to proclaim. We are here to announce and pronounce the gospel and the coming of our Lord. And to understand this plan properly, we should determine the meanings of those Greek words we just read there that was used in Scripture. The Greek word prog in osko, which is derived from the word Pro, which means before, and ginosko, which means no. In other words, it speaks of foreknowledge. He knew beforehand. God knew beforehand that you were going to be saved. God knew beforehand. And because he knew beforehand that you'll be saved, he predestined or predetermined that you become like his son, Jesus. You want to be taught? Take that. The word nosco that we've just read there from the Greek means to be, to perceive, to be aware and to absolutely understand. You see, to, 
to know to this degree is an act of relationship. Luke 1.34, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? This is her impregnation now. Since I do not know, Ginosko, a man. And if we take that verse into consideration and we bring it into the Romans 8 uh, 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 context, we understand that he's talking about a knowledge here that is intimate. He's talking about a relationship like a man with a woman. She said, how can I be pregnant? I've not been with a man. Now, that's not, of course, she's been with men. She's been with her father. She's been with her brothers, sisters, uh, her brothers, cousins, neighbors. But that being with, she spoke of an intimacy that only happens between a husband and a wife. And this is what God wants, is that foreknowledge of that intimacy that happens between you and I and He. And when we have that intimacy with Him, we are predetermined to become like the firstborn son. Are we together still? So to put Romans 8.29 in the right context, we must note that it means to predetermine beforehand that we will become like Jesus. What are you talking about? Yes, it's a process. He wants us to take on the nature, the character that Jesus reflected while he walked on earth. Yes, we don't just get born again and then we're like Jesus. We've got to work at it. We've got to work out, out that salvation with fear and trembling. It comes from one step of obedience to another step of obedience. It's progressive. As you obeyed to repent, and then you obeyed in accepting Jesus as Savior, you then had to grow into obedience to being baptized and obedience into accepting the Holy Spirit with it with the gifts and then obedience into fulfilling your calling the foreknowledge and predestination I'm talking about is always unto salvation we got to understand that it's never unto perdition or damnation God did not predetermine that some will go to hell and some will not that freedom of choice that Adam and Eve had, we still have. God is still saying, it's your choice. Follow me. It's your choice. It's your choice to become like my son. It's your choice. It's what I predetermined for you. But the choice is yours. God has never foreordained that anyone should be lost. But those who are saved as a result of their exercise of faith in the Lord were known, that ginosko, were known beforehand. And because of that, they were chosen to become like Jesus. This simply means that God knew us before we were born. And at that point, he already knew us in the sense of an intimate relationship. Let's read Ephesians 1 and verses 3 to 4. I'm not going to take much time now. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And just as he chose us, in other words, he foreknew and he predestined in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And because God foreknew who would accept Jesus in faith, he could 
predetermined beforehand or predestined before the foundation of the world, who would be the holy Christ-like people? In other words, who would conform to the image of his firstborn son? And now if we read Romans 8.29, he says, For whom also he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The Greek word therefore conformed is sumorphos, which means similar. In other words, he predestined that we'd become similar to Jesus. Similar in likeness, similar in resemblance, similar in representation. That's where an ambassador, you represent him here on earth. That's his purpose. That was his eternal plan. And as such, God predestined that we become fashioned like unto the likeness of Jesus. And I love this word fashioned, which suggests that we're being molded, we're being shaped to look like Jesus. That ugly, dirty, sinful old Steve, God is busy breaking and shaping and molding and saying, I don't like that, but Steve, I'm taking it off. And every time I think I've reached perfection, God says, no, 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 no. I need that removed, and I read that removed, and I need this built up, and I need that shape to look a little bit different. And he's busy doing the same in your life. And I'm ending with this now. To me, this implies that we allow the Holy Spirit to change us until we look like Jesus in character and in nature. Last scripture, Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Say this after me. He that has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? God didn't start working on you to let you go. God didn't start working on you that the minute you failed, you flopped, you fell back into sin or you backslid or you were weak or you disobeyed to give up on you. I always say to Carol, I'm so glad that I'm not God because I'd go to hell then. You see, God didn't give up on me. The more I failed, the weaker I became, the more mistakes I made, the more he was there and he said, come on, son, get up, let's go. This is not a hundred meter sprint. This is a long haul race. Let's do it. It is the Holy Spirit who begun the good work in you. It is he who is shaping and molding your character. And it is he who will complete it. Faith in and obedience to him produces in us the right thinking, the right motives, the right living, the right lifestyle, and the right relationships with God and with man. And this is what conforming to his image is about. And this was God's purpose for you and for me and i'm ending there we have said that we will break bread this week and i'm inviting you to break bread with me right now thank you Chrisma from oats Orden, who suggested this because the word of god does say that as often as you get together do this in remembrance of me so every time we gather, we should be breaking bread. And I'm going to take the bread. And Carol's going to come and share with me right now. And I ask you to do the same. The Lord, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And he broke it. And he said, this is my body that was sacrificed for you.
the body of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your son. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sin. And so also he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that was shed for you, the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I'm blessed for the privileged position to having had this opportunity to share. And I just pray right now that you'll step into obedience. You'll hear the call on your life. There's no other calling. God's got one purpose. He's got one plan. And that is that you and I endeavor to become like Jesus. And that through that, others will see him. God's plan is not for who we are in Christ. That's for baby Christians. But who Christ is within us. He wants you and I to reflect the love, the compassion, the grace, the nature of our Lord Jesus. And through that, we can edify each other. We can uplift each other, especially in times like these. This is a time to go and reach others. This is a time where there's a need that's great. Go and meet that need. Take Jesus to them through your lifestyle, through your love, through your compassion. I just thank you right now that you will touch the lives of those that hear me. Convict, Holy Spirit, those that still are reluctant to follow. Let them understand. God has not called the equipped, he equips the called. Let them understand that it's not about who we are, but it's about who we are. And so, Lord, I just bless you and I just praise you. I thank you that everyone within the sound of my voice right now will be blessed with the peace of our Lord Jesus, that their faith will be lifted. They will not look at circumstances. They will not look at a lack of business. They will not look at the fact that uh, without work right now, they won't look at the fear of coronavirus or anything out there, but their faith is in God and they know that Jesus is in the boat with them. So go forth and be blessed in Jesus' name until we meet again. God bless you.